you'll find out, Matthew, I'm not a candidate for an anchor on CNN, but uh, let's begin. <laughs> I just want to thank and welcome all the members and the briefers, some of whom uh, are dealing with uh, a different time zone and, and I'm sure are a little fatigued and I appreciate your participation. Uh, on the unfolding humanitarian crisis in Poland and Belarus, uh, and for that matter, Lithuania, uh, this briefing is entitled Update on the Manufactured Migrant and Humanitarian Crisis on the Poland-Belarus Border. Uh, and this is short notice. I really thank all of you uh, for making the time. Uh, we really want to uh, make sure staff and members are briefed up to date before we break for Thanksgiving. Um, I'm concerned that uh, this issue will continue and we want to be, make sure we're on top of it. Uh, I and Mr. Cicilline, all the members that uh, will be popping on. Mar Representative Castor, who is the head of the Belarus Caucus uh, and a senior member of Congress. And I must tell you, someone who knows a lot about what's going on the ground herself has joined us as well. Uh, it's just very disturbing that the, the reporting, the photos that we see, uh, the government officials in Belarus sanctioned and directed by the fraudulently elected Belarusian leader, uh, Alexander Lukashenko, the trafficking in individuals for the Middle East and Asia, bringing them to the border based on false promises. And we get into some of that. In the last several months, thousands of the individuals have tried to cross uh, to the European Union and they're enduring hor just horrific conditions, which I hope we uh, have our briefers describe and temperatures uh, that have around freezing. Uh, they're being deprived of food, water and shelter. Although we're hearing reports this morning that maybe there's some temporary shelter there. Uh, and it, it seems it's orchestrated wholly by Lukashenko to suit his political ends. Uh, and we've got to make sure uh, as we gather information uh, and working with our European Union allies in particular, that we hold this regime accountable. Uh, the US and the EU must act decisively. I think they have. I think they have, it's having effect. Uh, and do everything we can to increase the cost that they paid for these deplorable actions. Uh, and we really want to make sure that we're getting a timeline for implementation of all these actions and making clear uh, and transparent uh, what they are and why they're deemed appropriate. Uh, but at the heart of this right now, and this is why I'm so uh, grateful to have our briefers, is the effect it's having on the, in the lives of human beings that are brought into this untenable situation. Uh, Belarus and Poland must respect the human rights of these individuals. And it's truly a humanitarian crisis that's manufactured. Today, we're gonna to hear from several expert briefers who know what's going on on the ground. Uh, some of whom are on the ground, are, are as early as last evening on the ground to talk about what's happening, the latest, what the geopolitical implications would be of this crisis and how importantly Congress can work and continue to work uh, to, to some kind of resolution of this crisis. So I'm first uh, gonna ask uh, one by one, uh, the briefers uh, to give us a report about what's happening right now, what we should know, uh, suggestions about what we can do uh, that we haven't been doing uh, and uh, tell us uh, in an unvarnished way. This is not a public, uh, you know, recorded, you know, uh, briefing where they're taking down every word, but it, it, but it is public at the same time. So it's, it's a hybrid between a congressional hearing uh, and uh, what we would call a briefing. So uh, I think there's the, people will hear what we're saying, uh, but I think the format I'm trying to keep is very informal. So there's some give and take. First, we're gonna hear from uh, Mr. Matthew Chance. He's the senior international correspondent uh, from CNN. He, I'm sure is very tired right now. Uh, and uh, we really appreciate you taking the time uh, on, on this important issue. So I'm gonna turn it to you for some remarks. We're not gonna hold the clock on you, but what we think could be given the time frame we have working here, somewhere in the vicinity of five minutes, and then we can have some follow-up and interchange. So Mr. Chance. Uh, thank you, Representative Kiki. I'll, I'll make my 
my uh, remarks initially as brief as brief as I can. Thank you for the opportunity of, of letting me take part in this. Um, I'll try to um, give you a fair and accurate account of what, I, what I've witnessed. Um, I've got some Belarus experience, but I'm by no means a, an expert or a specialist in the field. But I would say that over the past you know, the past 12, 15 years, I've been based in Moscow uh, for CNN as a senior international correspondent. So I've been coming and going from Belarus over that time. I've interviewed uh, Alexander Lukashenko face to face on two occasions, once about 12 years ago and once about six or eight weeks ago, and, uh, in which I attempted to hold him to account for the uh, human rights abuses that have been conducted at the hands of his security forces against opposition figures in the country following the uh, elections, the fraudulent elections uh, last year. Um, I was also part of the first crew uh, from CNN internationally uh, that was allowed uh, up to that Polish border with Belarus and the refugee camps uh, camp that has sprung up there over the past couple of weeks to see firsthand the really uh, dire, appalling conditions in which more than 2,000 people, according to our estimates and according to official figures as well here in Belarus, um, have been sort of camped out in the exposed open um, you know, sort of field ne next to a, a forest uh, alongside that, that the barbed wire fencing that's been put up uh, to, to keep them enter from entering the European Union. Um, I've got some experience on reporting from refugee situations. I mean, one of my first stories, actually, as a journalist with CNN was the exodus of Kosovo refugees from uh, from Kosovo in 1999 uh, in the refugee camps, into the refugee camps in Macedonia. So and I've done several refugee crises uh, since there as when. So I've, I've got some experience in, in, in looking at that situation and dealing with it. This was one of the worst situations that I've witnessed in the sense that you know, the weather is incredibly cold. It's below freezing at nighttime, but uh, you know, it's obviously the brink of, it's not quite in the depths of winter yet, but the situation's about to get a lot worse. And so there's an urgency to the situation in dealing with these people. Uh, the level of supplies that they've got, humanitarian supplies, food, very, very scarce, hardly any being distributed at all, just maybe a slice of bread here and there. Um, uh, uh, for most of the time that I was there, people didn't have any shelter, no tents. They were building shelters out of tree branches that they chopped down and were piling them on top of each other and hiding, you know, sheltering from the wind and the cold uh, inside. These are very vulnerable people indeed, and that humanitarian aspect, and the women and the children there as well, particularly. Um, the, the humanitarian aspect of this is something I think uh, has caught international attention, despite everything that's going on in the United States right now. And it's it's really what I've tried to put across in our reporting on CNN. You know, these people trapped in this geopolitical standoff between Belarus on the one side and between you know and and Poland on, on the other side, which is you know uh, not letting them through. It's also crucial, I think, to have some on the ground reporting up there, not just to see what the Belarusians are doing, but also to put some eyes on what the Poles are doing as well. Remember, you know, the the, the Polish. Uh, authorities are part of the European Union, they're part of NATO, but they put an exclusion zone around that border area, which essentially forbids journalists, it stops aid workers, it even stops European border officials from actually going there and seeing for themselves what is actually happening. And so everything that the Polish say coming out of that border uh, comes from basically the Polish security forces up there and that's and that's not the best way to you know hold the security forces uh, there to uh, uh, to account again you know um you know what i saw were very dire conditions um i saw the growing frustration in the camps uh, of the people that you know have been told and who believed that this would be an easy route into the european union from their homelands the majority of them are from iraq from iraqi kurdistan in fact 99 uh, of them i'd say are from that part of the world um, and the growing frustration that emerged as they realized it wasn't going to be as easy as they thought. It was going to be impossible. They begged the Poles to let them through, marching to the border gate, trying to sort of appeal to the, uh, the security forces on the other side to let them through. But, you know, there's a determined political stance on the Polish side you know, not to allow these refugees to pass. It, it boiled over at one point two days ago into violence. And there were these absolutely, you know, horrific scenes as the refugees ran amok, the Polish side opened fire with water cannon to push the crowds back. There were stones being thrown by the refugees and sticks. You know, angry young men came to the fore, tear, trying to tear down the barricades. My lips actually are still burning from the, from the pepper spray 
uh, it, that was mixed in the pepper substance that was mixed into the water in the water cannons that we all got absolutely sort of drenched with uh, during those several hours of absolute chaos on the border between uh, Belarus and Poland. Throughout that whole time I was there, and I think this is important, the Belarus, Belarusian authorities, you know, did not intervene to stop that violence until it got to a point where they did intervene. And then when they intervened, the whole thing de-escalated. Uh, the whole uh, tension ratcheted down. They moved just yesterday to start bringing people into a makeshift sort of reception center. They're calling it a logistics center because normally it's for cargo, uh, where it's heated, where they're getting a hot meal every day. They're getting some tea. They've been given mattresses and new cl you know, warm clothes and blankets and things like that, which is a huge relief for a thousand people of the 2000 or more people that were in that camp. And I've just actually heard just before we, we started to live stream on this, on this, uh, on this, uh, you know, on, on this Zoom meeting. I haven't even said this on CNN yet. So you're getting this breaking news. The, the camp has now, according to border officials here in Belarus, uh, has now been cleared of the entire migrant popula population uh, uh, along that, that Polish border. So that's a, that's a huge relief um, from a humanitarian perspective. And I think, it, I, you know, I, I think it indicates that, you know, with the political will, the Belarusian authorities were always able to bring this to a, a rapid close. Um, I, I, I should also men mention that earlier on today, the reason I'm, I'm here in Minsk and not there is I came back to do a, a sit down interview with the Belar Belarusian uh, foreign minister, Vladimir McKay. Um, and, I, and I've done that. I've spoken to him uh, this morning and I, I got you know, the denials from him. That, uh, that, that the government come out with about them not being responsible for orchestrating this. Um, and some insight as well into the state of the negotiations between uh, Belarusian officials and their EU, European Union uh, counterparts to try and bring this crisis to a, uh, this current round of the crisis to, a, uh, to, a, to an end. Look, I mean, I, I, I'll, I'll answer any questions I can, as I say, as accurately as, as possible. But, you know, there's my little summary of what I can talk to you about today. Well, thank you. I think you brought one of the uh, issues. You brought a lot of issues, but uh, one of the issues I think we can speak of uh, as members of Congress, and uh, we'll discuss it with our colleagues, uh, is the fact that uh, the access to journalists, the access to UN observers and other uh, non-government, you know, uh, authority observers is critical because we have to have uh, some reporting, some honest reporting about exactly what's happening. Uh, and so your point that that access is very limited uh, is critical. And I think one of the things uh, I think are, just from what you said that we can act on is uh, try and uh, do everything we can to pressure access to uh, journalists, uh, non-government, organizations, uh, UN observers, humanitarian uh, observers into that area to make sure uh, that we know exactly what's going on now. And we've been joined by Congressman Mass too. Uh, uh, welcome Congressman. And uh, I'll now ask uh, Ms. Andrea K uh, Kendall Taylor, who's a senior fellow and director of the Transatlantic Security Program at the Center uh, for a New American Security uh, for some brief remarks. And briefing. Great. Well, thank you, Chairman Keating. And I don't know if um, Ranking Member Fitzpatrick is here, um, but thank you both for having me. That was obviously a very powerful um, briefing there. Um, obviously, we're here today to talk about Lukash the Lukashenko regime's exploitation of vulnerable migrants. Um, but before I turn to what the US Congress should be considering in response to this crisis, I do want to take a moment just to try to put the events in Belarus in context of what we see happening elsewhere in Europe. Um, of course, we're talking about the events that are unfolding in Belarus, but it is worth noting and highlighting that Russia too plays a role here. At a minimum, backing Belarus as Lukashenko continues to push migrants into the European Union. And it's not just Belarus where we're seeing these Kremlin provocations. Um, instead, I think you know, the events in Belarus need to be understood as part of a broader multifaceted pressure campaign by the Kremlin on Europe. So not, it's not just Belarus, but we're seeing the Putin regime is squeezing Europe's gas supplies ahead of the winter. 
so that Europe can't afford to oppose Russia without threatening its own winter heating. We see the Putin regime is encouraging Serbian nationalism. You know, Dodik is threatening to withdraw the Republika Srpska from uh, national Bosnian institutions, and it appears that he calculates that he has the backing of Moscow. Russia has ended its diplomatic ties with NATO, and most alarmingly, the Putin regime is again massing troops on Ukraine's borders. And it's those moves and the significant shift in Russia's rhetoric towards Ukraine that's raising the specter of a renewed military conflict. So obviously, each of these issues has their own particular roots and context. But I think from the Kremlin's perspective, there are dynamics in the United States uh, and Europe that are creating a more con conducive environment for such assertiveness and aggression. I think when Putin is looking out, he sees that Europe is divided and distracted. You know, a, a German Chancellor Merkel is on her way out of office, and it's unclear what the next German coalition will mean for Germany's Russia policy, although I think many of us expect it will be more of the same. Uh, France has elections this spring, and I think it's fair to say that there's no real consensus among the EU member states on how to approach Russia. And then, of course, here in the United States, I think when Putin looks at Washington, he's calculating that the United States doesn't really have an appetite for confrontation with Russia, given that we're signaling that we would rather expend the time and resources on competing with China. So I think it's important that we see that this thing in Belarus, these dots in my mind are connected. Um, it's part of this broader multifaceted campaign. So, but to get back, you know, to the Belarus crisis more specifically and what Congress should be considering, you know, sanctions is one of the things we clearly need to talk about. It already appears that the United States is looking to coordinate sanctions with Europe. Uh, the administration announced it's preparing new sanctions that will continue to hold the Lukashenko regime accountable for its attacks on democracy and norms. And that's, of course, a very important first step that comes on the back of EU sanctions. Um, those entities have yet to be decided, but we know that they will target airlines and travel agents and people involved with the illegal push of migrants. And those steps are having impact. So we've seen like the United Arab Emirates has curtailed passengers from several Middle Eastern countries from flying to Belarus. Turkish Airlines has restricted flights to Belarus. So I think keeping the pressure on governments and the private sector not to facilitate these flights and migrant flows is really important. And I think just a broad note on this, on this um, issue of sanctions, I would note that when Washington is thinking through how to use sanctions more effectively, that disruption should be and continue to be a key priority of US sanctions, especially as they relate to Russia and Russia related issues. So looking to use sanctions to to bust up these networks or these, um, you know, in this case, this manufactured crisis is a is it a very appropriate use of sanctions, I would say. Um, of course, we're, you know, we've heard that we, there may, the, the situation may be diffusing for now, but I would say if the situation escalates, um, then Washington should be willing to consider additional sanctions. Uh, we would want to clearly communicate those sanctions to the Luka, Lukashenko regime in advance. You know, obviously communicating in advance is more effective than imposing them after the fact. And if we do go down that path, it's very important to uh, communicate a path for how those sanctions would be lifted. And so to that end, you know, the, the United States could consider sanctions on Belarus, Belarus's uh, state-owned banks and entities like energy and steel and chemicals. Um, I know that consideration would need to be given um, to how to prevent those types of actions from increasing Russia's grip on Belarus by enabling Russian companies to buy them up. But David Kramer, I know this is an issue he's thought a lot about, um, you know, considering pairing them with sanctions on some Kremlin connected oligarchs who might be relevant in purchasing those assets would be one way that we could possibly mitigate against that risk. Um, important, again, the human, this is a humanitarian crisis, so sanctions is certainly not the only tool, and we do need to look for opportunities to support the humanitarian situation. As you said, um, Mr. Keating, it, you know, we do, uh, I think focusing on the humanitarian part of this is also particularly important because the Lukashenko regime and its propaganda is seeking to portray this crisis as the result of the European Union's refusal to abide by international law. Right. So we should be kind of taking on, I think it's so related to that, the US messaging is very important and we need to help push back on Lukashenko and Russia's disinformation narratives in this regard. 
Um, your point about pressuring Poland and Lithuania to allow journalists and human rights groups to the borders is really critical. I think there's a number of additional actions to consider, and we could talk through some of these, but it includes, again, allowing um, the EU's border service Frontex to offer assistance to the Polish border guards. You know, Lithuania and Latvia have taken advantage of those offers, but the Polish government has not. And similarly, the US can encourage the speeding up um, and expanding the legal processing of migrants. You know, many of the people who would cross into the EU would have their cases examined. Some may be found not to merit asylum and then could be sent back. Um, and then a third category, of course, um, slightly in the more medium term, though, is just sustained support for Belarusian civil society. This makes it, I think, more important than ever that the United States continues to highlight the Lukashenko regime's abuses on human rights and fundamental freedoms and international law. Um, to that end, the Biden administration should give Belarus opposition some high level visibility at the Summit for Democracy. Belarus at that summit should absolutely be on the agenda. And I think Congress could also send a strong statement of support by increasing annual assistance in fiscal year 2022. Um, the, the House State Foreign Operations Appropriation Bill, I believe, is at 30 million. Um, and it's not only civil society that needs these resources, um, but you know, so figuring out how to support independent media um, and the human rights in Belarus is, is key. And then I think the final thing I just wanna say is again, like about this broader agenda that the United States should consider not just in confronting Belarus, but really Russia's multi-pronged escalation of threats within Europe. I think so far the Biden administration has pursued a very sound approach to Russia. They're seeking to create that stable and predictable relationship. Um, they have this mix of con confronting Russia where they must and engaging where they can. And I think that was extremely reasonable to do right out of the gates. There was no reset and they have really sought to lower tensions in the relationship. But I think that these recent events, it's Belarus, Ukraine, the energy crisis with NATO, I think it's calling into question the sustainability of that current mix of confrontation and engagement. And I think it's now time to skew a bit more towards the confrontation side in that balance. I okay, think if we, I could yeah. I, I interrupt. I think we can, yeah. for the, everyone that's participating, I think we can go by past 10, given our schedule legislative, as you schedule allows, we'll do that. I, I really appreciate the concrete uh, suggestions directly through, and we're gonna circle back to those, but. Uh, bearing in mind uh, our uh, briefer's time, I want to segue uh, to Ukraine and uh, ask Mr. Pavel Slunkin, uh, number one, your impressions, but number two, uh, tell us what's going on with the breaking news this morning, uh, where the U.S. has uh, reportedly, this is something we didn't get briefed on, but there are reports already here in the U.S. <clears throat> that the U.S. is uh, warning uh, our European allies about the increased threat uh, of aggression right at the Ukraine border uh, by Russian troops. If you know anything about that to share, we'd like to hear, but also uh, on the subject, direct subject matter at hand. Uh, so Mr. Slunkin, if you could just uh, take a few minutes and share your, your, your reflections. Sure, thank you so much, sir. It's a special honor for me to speak before you today at this congressional hearings. And I'm grateful for the attention of the United States of your country to what is happening in Belarus, not only because I'm originally Belarusian and not only because I had to flee my country because of the political crisis, but also because 13 years ago when I was a student studying international relations, I first visited the United States of America to participate in an educational program there supported by the US Department of State. Its name is Benjamin Franklin Transatlantic Fellows Initiative. Since then, I graduated from the university, served as a diplomat for my country for seven years, been trying as I could to bring changes to Belarus from within the state system. But in 2020, I resigned in process against repression and rigged elections in my country. And now I'm here at the Congress again, proving that this transatlantic ties initiatives, they have a positive impact on the world. So thank you so much for this. Uh, much has changed in Belarus over these 13 years, but one thing remains unchanged. Alexander Lukashenko continues to hold on to power and breaks every possible law uh, and goes to any crimes for this. Now he's trying to use the new weapon, 
the new strategy, artificially creates migration crisis at the European Union and NATO borders. Matthew did a bright, brilliant presentation about what Poland is doing on the border, but we should not be misled to, uh, or from the primary source. The primary source is the Lukashenko's regime, who is uh, manufacturing artificially the crisis there. We haven't been seen any migration migration crisis on the border with Belarus and the EU in the previous years, because um, Belarus has never been the route for illegal migrations for the EU. Um, it's it's even illogical if you if you look at the map, you will understand this. We we had maybe dozens of people every year, but not more, uh, and now they are artificially brought from Middle Eastern countries. Uh, Belarusian government opened these new air flights from in Middle Eastern countries, and hundreds of people fly to Belarus every day, and then they are guided by special services to the border. So um, I will share with you my brief analysis of this situation. The migration crisis at the border didn't arise out of nowhere. Uh, it's artificially created, and it's a direct consequences of the ongoing political crisis in Belarus that has been lasting more than a year already since rigged elections in 2020. Lukashenko announced his plans to engineer the crisis right after the EU imposed forced package of sanctions against his government. And he, as we see, he kept his promise. What goals did Lukashenko pursue? There are three of them from my point of view. Uh, the first one is to make the youth talking to him, enter into dialogue with the one politician that they call a legitimate leader. Second, to shift the focus of attention and the agenda of relations from the topic of new elections, uh, the end of repression, the release of political prisoners, which were the main demands from the Western countries to his regime previously. Now he has switched the topic to the artificial migrants crisis. Uh, and third, influence to influence the Western sanctions approach. Uh, did he manage to achieve this goal? Uh, from my point of view, at least partially, yes. He received two calls from the German Chancellor, and the parties agreed to set up a negotiating group to solve the migration crisis. The new agenda of the migration crisis doesn't touch upon the issue of his absolute power, so it is in a much more comfortable position when he is not discussing his absolute power and his control over Belarus, but about issue of the crisis that he engineered with his own hands. So he created the crisis, he can easily stop it if he wants. There is now no unity in the European Union on the issue of sanctions. Some countries are in favor of tougher sanctions. Some countries don't want to exacerbate the situation after the conversation between the German Chancellor and uh, Lukashenko and insist on a softer approach uh, instead. What conclusions will Lukashenko draw out of this situation? His blackmail showed that it can gain some success. He escalated the situation and received some of the bonuses he wanted. That this type of political behavior, when he raises the stakes, and even in the most desperate situation in which Lukashenko is now, for him it proved efficiently and efficiency and has been proven its efficient efficiency through all his 27 years uh, in power. And I would consider it even as the secret of his political survival. During all these 27 years, he went on the attack and forced opponents, even the most powerful countries of the world, to retreat under its pressure. Uh, he did the trick again with the migrants crisis. And sorry to, for quoting his rude words, but they, I think, represent the sincere assessment of what the EU polit politics and politicians are in his eyes. In 2011, he once, uh, in the interview, he said that European politicians have no balls. And he, like many other authoritarian politicians, understands and respects only the language of force. Putin now knows how to talk to Lukashenko in this language, in the language of force. That's why Lukashenko never crosses red lines of Moscow. He perceives the language of dialogue and compromise as a sign of weakness, which uh, the, the dialogue which is usually used in Europe. And migrant crisis is the way how he talks to the EU now in the political language that he understands in the language of force and the power. Uh, so today, by agreement of Merkel and Lukashenko, the, the first uh, portion of migrants, about 400 people, they fled back to Iraq. Uh, this doesn't mean that the crisis has been resolved. The press secretary of the president announced that Belarus is now following what they uh, agreed upon with Merkel during, during the phone call. So that, that the solution was that uh, Germany allows around 2,000 people for the humanitarian corridor to, to Germany, to go to Germany. And uh, Belarus uh, asks the migrants who would like to flew back to Iraq and let them go there, organizes this with international money. Um, so from in the eyes of Lukashenko, he, how it looks like now that EU agrees to be blackmailed. 
Uh, I don't even can exclude that he will try this tactic again if he wants to achieve something else in relations with you, if he's not happy with, with what is happening. So this may be not uh, the last escalation at the border, or it may, he may, may be finding other any issues, how he can uh, force the EU to the dialogue to negotiate with him. In May, just, just a moment, in May he threatened uh, Europe with the possibility of illegal migrants, nuclear materials, and drugs. We have already seen the flow of migrants. So we, we, we can already know what to expect. That's, that's really concerning. Thank you very much for uh, sharing that. Uh, I wanted to just uh, the opening remarks and the uh, people briefing us uh, to end with uh, David Kramer uh, to deal with some of the human rights issues and, and what can be done. Uh, so I'm going to recognize David Kramer, a senior fellow at Florida International University's Sten J. Green School for International and Public Affairs. He's formerly the Assistant Secretary of State for Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor, and Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Europe and Eurasian Affairs. Mr. Kramer. Congressman Keating, thanks very much for having me. And it's a pleasure to join my fellow briefers who I think have covered the issue very comprehensively. I've been following Belarus for more than two decades and was responsible as the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Belarus and I served in the State Department from 2005 to 2008 when we imposed an initial round of sanctions when Putin, oh, sorry, excuse me, slipped there. Lukashenko uh, tried to steal the 2006 election and then put political prisoners in jail. Um, I, I think we have moved from a situation where Lukashenko is now no longer an illegitimate leader, which if anyone had any doubts, that should any those doubts should have been removed last August when he stole the presidential election and then launched a vicious crackdown on average Belarusians who were protesting against his theft of the election. He has now, I think it is safe to say, become a terrorist. I would not use the term state sponsor of terrorists, terrorism because that would connote that he is in charge of the state, that we would recognize him as leader of Belarus and we should never do so. But he is engaged not only in the theft of the election and the attacks on protesters, peaceful protesters, mind you. But then he hijacked a civilian airliner in May, forced it down in order to kidnap two people on that plane. He is now weaponizing migrants and refugees, engaging in human trafficking on a gross scale. And to me, this does fit the definition of terrorism. He is a danger and a threat, not only to the people of Belarus, but to the rest of Europe and to the West as a whole. I think we should uh, urge uh, an investigation by the ICC, which I recognize takes a considerable amount of time. He's responsible for crimes against humanity um, and we should treat him accordingly. Um, I, I do- I, I could just for seconds uh, uh, and we might get back. I don't know if, uh, I wanted to thank uh, uh, Matthew Chance. I don't know if he's still on, but he's gonna be pulled off uh, for doing, uh, for coming on. He's being pulled by CNN to cover a breaking story. Uh, so uh, if you're still on, Mr. Chance, thank you very much uh, for your participation. Uh, and we understand uh, you're getting pulled off on a breaking news story. I apologize, uh, Mr. Kramer, go right ahead. No problem at all. Um, so, so in light of this, what I would recommend is, yes, tightening the sanctions on Belarus, go after every sector that Lukashenko depends on. Um, but just as important, arguably more important, is to go after his Russian supporters and backers. Without Russian support, Lukashenko would not be in power today. And Putin has provided him a lifeline. He's met with him numerous times provided him financial support, political support, military and security support. We have to recognize that without Putin, Lukashenko would not be there. Therefore, it is critically important in my view to go after the Russian sources of support for him. I would also argue, by the way, that Lukashenko gets vital support from some Gulf states and in particular, the UAE. And we should make it clear to them as an ally, they have a choice. They can stay in the good grace of the United States or they can do business with Lukashenko, but not both. This, this, is, this is a critical situation. Uh, it was last summer, it's been made much worse this year. And I think unless and until we make every effort to uh, remove him from power, not sending in the US military, don't get me wrong, we have other tools we can use, but working with our European allies and fellow democracies, 
and making sure he is never legitimized, never recognized as the true leader of Belarus. Um, but in fact, that as long as he stays there, Belarus will remain a threat. Um, we, we need to do everything we can on an urgent basis. Otherwise, more uh, innocent refugees and migrants will die along the border. More Belarusians will be thrown in jail and, and killed. Um, and we could face uh, who knows what other kinds of threats from uh, a person I would describe as a lunatic with Russian support. Thank you, sir. Well, thank you. I'm going to do this uh, given the uh, nature of the time. Uh, I'm going to ask two questions at the same time, at least initially. Uh, so uh, I'll briefly ask a question, then I'll ask uh, uh, Representative Tenney to ask a question, then have the panel respond. Then I'll have Representative Cicilline, Representative Captor ask each ask questions, and then you can respond just so we move things along in that regard. Uh, I, I, I want to follow up clearly uh, and ask the panel, there's been some great suggestions uh, on uh, the US-Russia uh, you know, ability of us to pressure Russia because uh, Putin is in a situation where he has to, I think, uh, domestically along with his long-term uh, uh, you know, policies, if you want to call it that, uh, wants to protect the, the connection and, uh, with Belarus, uh, as aggravating as Lukashenko has been to him over time. So I want to ask how we can uh, approach Russia directly uh, to try and uh, pressure them in this situation. Now I'll call on uh, Representative Tenney to ask a question as well. And let's try it this way to see if we can move things quicker. Uh, Representative Tenney. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to the witnesses. Uh, excellent. Uh, I have a lot of questions. I'm just trying to figure out where I want to begin. Yeah, if we uh, could just do one at a time. Then. Yeah, we'll do one quickly. Um, I just want to uh, attention to Mr. Kramer um, on Poland, the Baltic countries discussing, are, are we discussing triggering NATO's Article 4 uh, on this issue, you know, which would be, you know, launch any consultations about the military alliance and the members and what role the Alliance should play in addressing this attack on members? Is that something that's out there or we should pursue? Okay, could you take uh, you know, those two questions quickly and, and then we'll go to Representative Cicilline, Representative Captor. Sure, um, uh, so Congressman Keating on your question, keep in mind that the then Deputy Secretary of State Steve Began and George Kent, the DAS at the time, went to Moscow last September for consultations with the Russians about Belarus. And, and came came back with nothing. Um, Putin should understand that Belarus is a country that has been, if not favorably disposed toward Russia, neutral toward it. He runs the risk of turning the people of Belarus against Russia. Putin in Ukraine, Belarus, Georgia, other countries along Russia's borders has a poor understanding of his neighbors. Um, and he doesn't realize that he risks antagonizing and alienating everyone along Russia's borders. I don't think there is a way of persuading them. Putin does not want to see Lukashenko driven from power through a popular protest movement. That sets a bad example for him in Russia and Russia, and in his mind, might give Russians an idea that they could do the same in his country. So I think he's sticking with Lukashenko to the end, and I don't think there is uh, much hope in, in finding common ground with Moscow on how to deal with Belarus. Um, Congresswoman Tenney, on your question about Article 4, uh, to the best of my knowledge, polls and others have, in fact, uh, been considering this. It has not yet been invoked, um, and but I think actually it is worth doing because you're absolutely right. We're talking about three countries here that are not just EU members. This is not just an EU problem. They are NATO members, Latvia, Lithuania, and Poland, and they are bearing the brunt of this, and it does impinge on security interests and the NATO alliance. So I, I certainly would support what you're getting at. Ms. Kendall Taylor or uh, Mr. Slunkin, do you have any comments on those two? Uh... No, I, I mean, I definitely agree that I don't think Russia will be a very receptive uh, audience for the pressure. And so it kind of, we resort to those types of more confrontational tactics, but things like supporting investigative journalism so that we can continue to shine light on these types of things. Um, uh, so kind of, no, I, but, but so it, it has to be part seen, I think, in part of this kind of broader confrontation where the United States, in my view, could be doing more kind of to, to push back on what um, these rogue regimes like the Belarusians and the, and the Russians are doing. And then the only thing I would highlight here in the NATO context is it would sure be nice to have a U.S. ambassador to NATO at this time. 
um, given everything that is going on, I think it's absolutely imperative that we get Julie Smith in place. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Slunkin. Any comments? Yeah, I, we should remember that Putin uh, was the one who recommended Angela Merkel to talk to, the, to Lukashenko directly. And after this negotiations with Putin, she called to Lukashenko. So I think that Russia, we don't have any proof facts that Russia is participating or orchestrating, but for sure, uh, Russia is backing Lukashenko here. And I'm sure that Lukashenko won't be ready to start the attack against the EU without permission from, from Moscow. So he for sure consulted and he's been informing Moscow since, since the beginning of the migrants crisis. How should we talk to Russia about the political crisis uh, in Belarus? Putin, uh, even today, just several minutes ago, he mentioned that he understands that there is a political problems in Belarus and that uh, Belarusian government should start uh, a dialogue with opposition in Belarus. But uh, the problem is that all the Belarusian opposition either fled the country or is in prison. So I just can't imagine how, how it could happen. And um, talking about maybe sanctions, this is the most important uh, part about, about Russia. Because when we sanction Belarus and the Belarusian government, the only way to bypass the sanctions are through Russia. This means that Russia will be even earning money on, on this Belarusian problem. So uh, the secondary effect is that we still don't know about the general license, it's not directly mentioned there. So it, it, it says that it allows punishment for the companies that will help the Lukashenko regime to bypass the sanctions, but we still haven't had any explanation from the American officials whether they are planning to uh, impose this secondary sanctions. Right. And this would be the right instrument, maybe the, the, the one working instrument to talk about, to, to talk to Russia. Okay, thank you. And uh, I wonder too, whether the, uh, the latest, uh, just early morning reports about uh, the threat at the Ukraine border of Russian troops is a deflection of the tension away from this. But I'm going to ask uh, Representative Cicilline and Representative Captor to uh, ask their qu first questions uh, uh, together, you know, one after the other, different questions. So, uh, Mr. Cicilline and then Ms. Captor. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman Keating, and thank you to our briefers. This has been really, really helpful. Um, I, you know, I think, Mr. Kramer, you are absolutely right that the prospects of uh, persuading Vladimir Putin that the long-term risks of his behavior might cause the Bella Russian people to turn against him is pretty unlikely. And he seems very sort of opportunistic in these kinds of events. And so my question is really two parts. One is, you know, in addition to the UAE, are there other places that Lukashenko and Lukashenko regime are being financed that we have an ability to pressure because I think that's key. And secondly, what, what anyone thinks about the state of uh, the opposition, as uh, Mr. Slunkin just mentioned, most of them have fled the country or are in prison. So if the pressure is not going to come from Russia to drive out Lukashenko, obviously it has to come from the, from the people within the country. And what's the best thing for us to do as, con as members of Congress to fortify or help build up that civil society without it becoming like American intervention and helping feed the propaganda of the Lushenko regime that this is, you know, America trying to come take over their country. Yeah, Representative Captor, Chair of the uh, Belarus Caucus. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much for a very, very informative briefing. And we thank all of those who made excellent presentations this morning. My question really, um, I, one small question, one big question. The small question is, it's my understanding that uh, it is actually Russian troops that are uh, patrolling the border between uh, Belarus and Poland. Uh, I'd like to know if that in fact can be verified. And number two, I'm very interested in your views about Russia using migration as a form of hybrid warfare over the last uh, decade. So for example, if we look at 2015, uh, well over a million uh, Syrians uh, that created uh, with that vast migration flow into Europe, a uh, very, very destabilizing situation, uh, which still has repercussions today. Uh, and um, some of that migration tied to the drug trade. Um, but I've, I've really been interested in Russia's role in using migration in different places as a tool of warfare, and especially for destabilization. Any comments you can make on either of those? Who's, who's at the border, Russian troops at the border uh, between Ukraine and Poland um, uh, and Belarus? And then um, the issue of Russia's 
mastery really historically over the last oh, 100, 100 years at least in terms of using migration as a tool of warfare. I don't know who wants, wants to begin. Uh, Ms. Kendall Taylor, would you like to begin? Sure, I can jump in. I think um, I don't, so there has been um, Russian involvement in terms of military exercises and other displays of force in order to back the Lukashenko regime. So my understanding so far is what we've seen is Russia did send two nuclear capable strategic bombers on a training mission over Belarus to, to show that strong support for Belarus amid this crisis. We also saw that Russia and Belarus held joint uh, paratrooper drills near Poland, but I don't think it's them that's responsible for actually patrolling um, the border. So, but it's been, again, you know, talk, I think Pavel was talking about this language of force um, and it's there Putin being willing to back Lukashenko kind of to the end. Um, maybe I'll say a couple of words on our ability to support Belarusian civil society. I mean, you know, this is it's a similar dynamic to what we see happening in Russia as well, as there are large outflows of both Russians and Belarusians as the repressive env environment increases. And so this, I think, provides an opportunity for the United States and Europe to be able to support these communities outside of their countries. Um, whether it's helping them, making it easier to establish their NGOs inside those countries, whether it's facilitating and streamlining their ability to apply for funding. Uh, I think, you know, the United States in particular with the investigative journalism could increase support to these people who are trying to continue to shine a light on the corrupt networks and abuses of the regime. So um, just because they've left the country doesn't mean, you know, that we can't support them. They can be effective working as diaspora communities. But I think if we are talking about then how to starve these regimes, these, you know, the Biden administration has made anti-corruption a cornerstone of, of U.S. foreign policy. And I think this is a really effective way to go after these regimes. You know, we've talked a lot with the in Congress has been a huge leader of this with the anti-kleptocracy caucus. So advancing those efforts, I think, is a really effective way. I think it's time also that we, you know, we've been very much in the resilience mode, but I do think we could shift our mind and start taking more offensive actions in the anti-corruption domain, whether it's sanctioning people around Putin and Lukashenko, uh, using sanctions to try to bust up these corrupt networks, because these are regimes that are based on patronage and these kind of illicit finance and all of these things. And if we can starve some of the resources of the regime, uh, that is another way to kind of kind of take the legs out from under them as well. Well, as was stated a little bit earlier, we provided we increased from eight uh, million to 30 million assistance uh, in uh, our uh, state foreign ops bill to um, assist these diaspora groups and so forth. Uh, but um, I, I'm, I appreciate your clarification there and uh, I'm very interested in anyone's views on Russia's, it seems to me, uh, increasing use of migration very strategically to cause chaos. Yeah, Mr. Uh, Kramer, uh, perhaps you could uh, have the opportunity to uh, you know, reflect on the two questions. And uh, also I'm curious, given the last comments by uh, Mr. Cicilline and Ms. Kendall Taylor about maybe some of the U.S. Uh, uh, or base corporation interest and some of the investments. What's happening? I, I hear stories. Some of the high-tech companies are moving out of Belarus or relocating. But again, to those questions uh, asked by uh, Representative Casters and Cicilline, Mr. Kramer or Mr. Slunkin, any comments? Mr. Kramer? Sure, sure. Um, so first on Congressman Cicilline's question about the financing. Um, Reifheisen Bank has had a very sordid history of doing business in Belarus and with the Lukashenko regime. And so I would I would look very carefully at Reifheisen. Um, and, and there have been a few other banks. Sverbank also, the Sverbank is in Russia, um, has played a, a critical role in supporting uh, Lukashenko and Mikhail Gutsaryev, who's a Russian oligarch, has been one of the key backers of Lukashenko, along with his son. Unfortunately, the United States did not join the European Union and the UK in sanctioning Gutsaryev. Those two did. We did not. And I'm, I'm at a loss to understand why we did not do so. So at a minimum, uh, Gutsaryev should be included on the U.S. sanctions list so that we are in greater conformity with the U US, uh, the EU rather in UK list, sorry. Um, on on the uh, Congressman, Congresswoman Capture, your, your question about the migration, 
um, as you know, you've been a leader on issues involving Ukraine. Um, we see this in Crimea, uh, where Russia has deliberately tried to send Russians into Crimea to delete the Crimean Tartar population, which wasn't huge to begin with. And as you know, the treatment of Crimean Tartars has been absolutely abysmal um, and something that I think we need to continue to speak out about. I, I will say that the U.S. mission at the OSCE has done a very good job in, in raising this issue on a consistent basis. Um, but you're right, they, they do use migrants as weapons to punish countries that impose sanctions, whether on Belarus or on Russia. Um, they do exploit the situation as they did when you, as you rightly point out in 2015. They also use it for propaganda purposes. They play into the anti-immigrant sentiment that exists in some European countries. And they look at this threat coming into Europe because uh, some countries open their doors and they say, this is not what you want. And this is what happens in, de in democracies. We have control over our situation. Russia, in fact, of course, is quite dependent on migrant labor, particularly coming from Central Asia. And yet they treat migrants who are in their country quite poorly. Um, it, it gets at a larger point, if I may just, and I'll, I'll end with this, uh, Congressman Keating, um, about predictability and stability. Putin thrives on creating unpredictability and instability. I think the administration was completely off the mark and calling for a predictable and stable relationship because that's not what Putin wants. He doesn't like to be ignored. He doesn't like it when we say we want to put Russia in a box so that we can focus on China. Uh, he thrives on unpredictability and instability. To be clear, sometimes this backfires on him. But overall, he likes to keep us guessing. He loves it when the international community is asking the question, what do you think Putin will do? Um, he, he wants this kind of atmosphere, and it's a dangerous atmosphere. And it's why I think we have to come to grips with the fact that, yes, I've described Lukashenko as, as a serious threat. Putin is as well. Great. Mr. Chairman, I just uh, wanted to comment, if I could, that when I think back to the 2015 crisis with Russia's bases in Syria, for example, naval bases, and many, many of those migrants came across the waters, right, to Italy, to, to Europe, to Hungary, and so forth. Uh, that was, and, and probably using a lot of um, pirates uh, and people involved in the drug trade on any kind of dinghy that they could find to get across the sea, right? He knows those waters really well, Putin. Uh, he's an expert in that. And in terms of the history of Europe with the former Ottoman Empire and the invasions that occurred there in the collective memory uh, of countries like Poland, for example, uh, the idea that you're bringing people in, you know, uh, first of all, traveling from east to west so they could be bringing anything into Poland. I'm not forgiving Poland, but there is a, like a collective memory there that makes this really a powerful uh, tool of instability. Uh, and hybrid warfare. So I just wanted to put that on the record. Yeah, quickly, if I could, could, could I just, sorry, I just wanted to take uh, one more quick opportunity for questions with uh, uh, going Republican, Democrat with uh, Representative Tenney uh, and myself, and then have you circle back on anything that we didn't cover you think is important? And I'll be very narrow and, and brief. We've seen Belarus now move to these warehouse facilities or the warm facilities. We've seen them take that action. I'm, I'm curious, is it the sanctions or is it international pressure? In your opinion, what made them make that move when they did, where they hadn't before? Now, Representative Tenney, if you have a question. Representative Tenney. I think you're on mute. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, um, I was just curious. I know that uh, Ms. Kendall Taylor was talking about about Putin and the regime, and and um, and you kind of linked. You actually said that this is uh, the regime is behind the the migrant crisis. Are you concerned about what's the, the impact on Ukraine, and that this is just a pretext for building up troops? Uh, and, and causing a, even more of a problem in the Ukraine. I know you sort of alluded to that and you sort of made the conclusion that, you know, he's definitely behind, Putin is definitely behind this crisis. Do you think this is all part of greater strategy to, to, get, to get even more into Ukraine? Great, and also, uh, Representative Kaptur, if I could, just to cap it off, I think Mrs. Cicilline is gone. Uh, 
Do you have any last question you'd like to pose to, to the panel? And then that'll be it for questions and I'll let the panelists have some closing remarks. No, Mr. Chairman, I'm just interested in the, uh, the role of migration as a okay. uh, form of hybrid uh, warfare. Well, thank you. Views on so, uh, you know, it'd be interesting. Why did they make that move? Was there something that triggered the move uh, to give them more humanitarian uh, places to be? And Russia, and, and that's something I tried to hit myself as well. Uh, is this for, you know, foretell anything with Ukraine uh, and the buildup we're hearing and the warning that the U.S. had reportedly given to uh, our European allies uh, just within the last 24 hours? So. Uh, I'll just ask you to address any of those, those two questions. And also we'll pause and, and shift back to all of you for final comments. I can jump in first. Pavel, maybe you wanna to speak to the Belarus in terms of like, how do you explain the timing? But um, I think on the Ukraine question, I don't know that the Putin regime needs the Belarus situation to distract from what they're doing in Ukraine. I think whatever it is that they're planning, I am worried about it. And I think it will could has the potential to be large scale. So in that sense, I don't think that they're looking for a distraction. I think they're actively moving to accumulate forces on the border that would enable them to execute on a large scale kind of inter intervention into Ukraine. Um, you know, when you look at what, A, in terms of the military movements that they've made, I don't think the Putin regime has made a political decision exactly what they want to do vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine, but it is clear that the military has been given orders to prepare for a potentially large scale intervention. So when you couple the military moves that you see, the other thing that's very different than 2014, in many ways, this is a continuation of the buildup that we saw in 2014. They left a lot of these forces behind. And so this is kind of a continuation to what we saw back in the spring. Um, the difference is now that they are moving positions in a more covert kind of under the, you know, under the cover of darkness. Um, and so it does suggest, I think, in that sense, it makes it raises many more questions about what it is that Putin wants to accomplish vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine. But when you couple the military moves with, I think, some very dramatic shifts in the rhetoric and the way that the Kremlin is talking about Ukraine, it is very concerning. You have Putin talking about Ukraine as a vassal state. You know, he had that op-ed, was followed by an op-ed in Commerçant by Dmitry Medvedev. They believe that the Ukrainian state is backed and propped up by the West. And if only they could get rid of the Western backing that Ukraine would move to a more kind of compliant pro-Russian friendly government. And so, uh, and then they've also moved the red lines of what they find unacceptable in Ukraine. So initially, originally, historically, Putin has said that uh, NATO membership for Ukraine is what his red line is that needs to be off the table. In his comments at Valdai, he has changed that to say that he no longer accepts or will tolerate uh, NATO um, infrastructure in Ukraine. So I think what it, it, th those two things together, I think are extremely concerning. And so I think the connection with the Belarus piece is just kind of this multifaceted pressure campaign that I think is designed to so, um, to undermine cohesion in Europe, to wear Europe down so that they're maybe have a more, I don't want to use the word accommodating, but a heart, you know, that they don't want to take the Kremlin on um, in, in that way. So I, so again, I think it's connected in the sense that I think we're seeing pressure in multiple places that is designed, I think, to reduce resolve to stand up firmly to the Kremlin. Yeah, let me just say, I don't, I didn't think it was a distraction. It's a pretext. Uh, it's definitely, it's beyond a distraction. I think I agree with you on that. Okay. But it, I mean, obviously they have, there's an ulterior motive here, but I think it's all part of the grand strategy as you allude to. So thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, we're joined by Representative Costa uh, as well. But Mr. Slunkin and Mr. Uh, Kramer, if you want to react to that, and then uh, we'll, we'll just close and but if you two could react to those questions and, and then I'll just ask you any, for anything we haven't discussed that you want to discuss. So Mr. Slunkin, do you have anything to add to this? Frankly, no, I, I suppose. What, 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 what pressured or what led to Belarus adopting more of a humanitarian concern? Uh, I think that, yeah, Lukashenko understands as already mentioned that they, they use, they use uh, the, 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 the language of power. So um, 
I don't really have like easy is a decisions here, but I'm sure that the Lukashenko is the person who for whom humanitarian nations don't really uh, are important. They're, they're, they're really not important for him. So uh, I think that the pressure should be uh, should, should touch his, his personal power uh, so that he would feel that the price uh, the cost for him are increasing all the time and that he's paying for the migrants crisis even more than the EU or Poland and Lithuania. And in this situation, he will be feeling that he is losing the war, he's losing the, the crisis, and only in this situation, he will step back. Uh, no humanitarian issues, no like uh, emotions will, will make them uh, act differently because he's just the guy that, 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 that does what, what he's in now. Mr. Kramer? In, in um, Lukashenko doesn't care about the welfare of these people. Um, something undoubtedly occurred during his conversation with Chancellor Merkel that uh, led him to make a change. Um, but I, I would uh, assume that this is a temporary change. Um, Lukashenko doesn't care about his own people, uh, and he's certainly not going to care about people from the Middle East. He's just using them um, in a terrible, awful way. And so uh, one thing I would just add, and it picks up on what uh, Representative Tenney was getting at too, if Putin wanted to, he could have uh, not recognized Lukashenko as the winner in last year's election. If Putin, Putin wanted to, he would not have supported Lukashenko after he hijacked the Ryanair flight in May. And if Putin wanted to, he would have put a stop to Lukashenko's efforts with uh, exploitation and human trafficking of these migrants and refugees. He's not. He's supporting Lukashenko. So I think uh, this reinforces the point that without Russian support, without Putin's support, Lukashenko would have been finished by now. And I think we have to look much more carefully at Moscow uh, for the root of this problem and arguably many others. Uh, this is, that's, these have been very important points. Uh, what I'm going to do is, uh, uh, Representative Costa has a question. If, if you could ask your question, Representative, and then I'll ask you to address this question and then any areas that you'd like to touch on that we haven't touched on uh, for closings, if there are any, uh, we'd like to hear them. And then we'll uh, close this briefing. Representative Costa. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman Keating. And uh, I apologize, I was at another meeting, but Mr. Kramer and, and, and for the other two reporters uh, uh, of the comments that I, 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 I was able to catch up with, I mean, clearly uh, for Putin, um, um, Belarus is a, a, a proxy state, and and where my concerns are, given the past history of or recent history of Russia with Crimea, and their actions on Ukraine, uh, is this all part of a a, a pretext uh, from Putin's uh, uh, pro uh, focus to to really um, engage in in in, in taking action? Within Ukraine, um, because I think that uh, clearly uh, uh, the the agenda that uh, Putin has is, is 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 I think you you outlined it. I mean, he's he's concerned about uh, Ukraine's efforts with uh, the West and where that may lead it to. And uh, so, if if that's the case, if this is basically a series of steps leading up to Russia taking action with Ukraine. What is our best effort in terms of, of, of putting a check there uh, to let uh, Putin know that this is not something we're going to accept? Uh, and obviously, to that degree, uh, we have to have a, a, a consensus, a, a strategy with our European allies. And so I'd like to get your thoughts or comments on, on if, if this is part of a larger um, plan on Putin's part. And what we should be doing, and in fact, if, if we want to prevent this from taking place. Um, Congressman Costa, I, I, think, I think you're right. Um, the, only, the only hesitation I would have is I'm not sure Putin has thought this through completely himself. Um, and he may be making up some of this on his own uh, as, as it goes along. He has a crisis in his own country. The pandemic is raging out of control and Russians don't see him or the Russian government doing anything about it. The economy is stagnant. There's no vision for improving the Russian economy. So Putin uh, usually looks for deflections and invasion. Deflection and distraction. <laughs> it, it, deflection, uh, it, deflections and distractions, absolutely, sir. 
And, and, and Georgia has paid the price. Ukraine has paid the price. Um, Syria has paid the price. Um, and so I, I, I do think that there is serious concern about the Russian buildup along the border with Ukraine these days, more than it was in, in the spring. Um, but I'm not sure Putin has thought through completely what would happen if he moved Russian forces further into Ukraine. Ukrainians were not that enthusiastic about joining NATO before 2014. After the Russian invasion of Ukraine, but more than 50% of Ukrainians want to join the NATO alliance. Again, this is an example of Putin's poor understanding of his neighbors because a lot of his actions and policies wind up backfiring on what should be Russia's national interest. But let me just add very quickly, Putin's interest and Russian national interests aren't necessarily the same. Putin's interests are staying in power however he can. And that includes propping up bad leaders like Lukashenko, like Assad in Syria, like Maduro in Venezuela, um, coming back to Congresswoman Captor's point, uh, the, the Russians are accused of war crimes and crimes against humanity in Syria with the bombings. They contributed to the refugee outflows from Syria that went into Europe. So again, your point about the weaponization of migrants, absolutely right. And so I, I, Congressman Coster, I think on, on what we should do with Ukraine, um, they're not asking for U.S. troops on the ground to fight their uh, battle for them. They're asking for weapons to be able to fend off a further Russian incursion. And to me, that we are doing some of that, to be, to be fair to the administration and the previous administration. Um, but I think nowhere near enough. And we need to tighten sanctions and go higher into the Russian leadership, including, I would argue, Mr. Putin himself. Well, okay. any uh, closing comments that anyone might have? Uh, you've gone over and I appreciate it. Any critical point that we've left out? We really covered, I think, most of the critical points. We covered it. I think the only thing I would just add to what David said is maybe the Putin regime hasn't decided exactly what it is he wants to do, but he is leaving all his options open. And it is my sense that he senses opportunity. I mean, he sees and, you know, again, I, as I said in my opening remarks, kind of uh, Merkel is leaving the scene. We don't know what will follow next with the German coalition. It's likely to be more of the same. You have the French election. I think he looks at the United States trying to focus on China and senses that the United States isn't willing to marshal the energy and the resources to to seriously confront Putin because we want to stay focused on China. So, you know, and, and, and that has led to backing the Lukashenko regime with the migrant crisis, cutting off ties with NATO. The energy crisis is really serious. It's inflicting a lot of pain on the Europeans, yeah. uh, makes it such that, you know, they're, I think, concerned about taking on Putin in, because it risks their winter heating. So he is, he's leaving all of his options open. Um, and, I, you know, I think when he looks at Ukraine, uh, he doesn't believe that any future Ukrainian leader, so long as the United States and Europe are present, will be willing to implement Minsk or, in a, you know, do it in a way that would be favorable to Russia's outcomes. And so I think he's also shifting his mindset and thinking about legacy. And I think this is a really critical time. It makes it all the more important that we try to shape that calculus now. The administration has raised the alarm bells. We're sharing information with allies and partners to try to get them on the same page. Bill Burns went to Moscow. You know, we're, we're sending, uh, I, Austin is going out to Ukraine. I think we're trying to signal our resolve um, and, and our support for Ukraine. But I think we also have to think, you know, Putin has moved the red line on Ukraine um, to say that he'll no longer accept Ukrainian infrastructure. I think we need to signal that we don't accept that red line. Um, and to work through NATO, you know, people are talking about perhaps creating a NATO defense uh, deterrence fund for Ukraine. So I think it's a, this is really a critical time. This isn't going away. I don't think Putin has made up his mind. And I do think we need to take some uh, forceful steps to try to shape the calculus because um, in my mind, one of the things that is within the realm of options is that Putin would consider taking Eastern Ukraine and redrawing the boundary. Um, so I think there's some serious scenarios that are on the table that we need to think through. I know we've, we can look at that objectively and say, like, why would Putin do that? The cost would be high. But we've said that a lot of times before. You know, we didn't think he would put troops into Syria, for example. We've looked at these situations objectively and wondered why would Putin do that? He wouldn't do that. And we've been wrong a lot of times. And I, so I think we have to take it really seriously. Well, thank you so much. Uh, any other comments? Uh, I just want to thank you all. Uh, this has been very important, timely. Uh, we want to follow this uh, issue up, uh, perhaps with a formal uh, committee hearing. Uh, but 
we've been able to garner a lot here. Uh, part of it uh, is all roads lead back to Russia. We say that too many times, but it seems to be true once again with all your commentary uh, and how we can pressure them and, and how the idea that they could benefit uh, with what's going on in Belarus, not just uh, politically, but with energy concerns and economically is troublesome. Uh, I do think that we have to look at sanctions and how they're targeted and what messages go with those sanctions. Uh, you know, and I think we can see if there's a nexus to oligarchs that uh, would, in particular, that's the way to pressure them the most effectively. Uh, but we, we're left with Belarus and what's happening in the border and what's happening with those 2,000 people. And uh, I do think we're going to work in Congress uh, to try and pressure or raise the issue of having uh, access for journalists, transparency, uh, having uh, UN or other NGO observers, human rights observers, uh, being able to have access to see what's going on, even though they're out of the field, apparently, and into this warehouse type setting. We have to, uh, I think, uh, engage with NATO more, uh, whether it's Article 4 or other issues, or what's been mentioned uh, in terms of uh, NATO deterrent uh, initiatives uh, for this. And importantly, uh, let's not forget our focus on this. Uh, the humanitarian concerns for those 2,000 people that were literally drawn into this area with promises. Many of them sold their homes, all their belongings, left everything behind, took their families, only to find themselves stranded in, in life-threatening conditions, which, uh, you know, Matthew Chance, who's covered uh, other uh, humanitarian crisis before in his career has termed the worst he has seen, just to put things in perspective. Uh, that's quite a statement he made initially when he was on with us. So uh, whether it's finding a plan forward so that those seeking asylum can move in that direction and also finding a safe harbor home for those people that want to return home. Uh, those are our critical areas and, and your, your participation this morning has helped us focus uh, on those. Uh, would welcome any further input that you have to the committee. Uh, you know, uh, on a, one of the busiest mornings we ever could imagine here in DC, we've had the, uh, the leaders in European uh, issues uh, from the House side uh, involved in this. So uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you for your expertise. Thanks. Thank you for your interest. And uh, this has been very helpful. So with that, uh, I'll adjourn uh, this briefing. Uh, and uh, I'm sure we'll continue to discuss this important matter. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.